floods are a yearly occurrence in many areas of our country, causing untold damage to highways and bridges. It is seldom economically feasible or necessary to bridge the entire width of a watercourse at design flood stage. Thus, roadway embankments are constructed on the flood plain, thereby constricting the flood flow and occasionally causing the loss of a structure. Scour in the vicinity of bridge abutments and piers has been and continues to be a problem to highway and bridge engineers. Scour in varying degrees of severity occurring at existing bridges may require repair of these problem areas after each major flood. Repairing areas that have scoured is expensive and very difficult. It is more practical to reduce scour by preventive measures. Spur dikes placed adjacent to the bridge abutments accomplish this purpose. The following scenes illustrate graphically what occurs during a flood. Before construction of a highway across a river, the flow pattern is relatively uniform. The main channel is shown in dark blue and the overbank area in light blue. When a highway embankment is placed on the floodplain, the obstructed flow must move towards the bridge opening. Depending upon the momentum of the flow that must turn to pass through the bridge opening, in relation to the total momentum of flow, scour in varying degrees of severity occurs in the vicinity of the bridge abutment. The resulting direction of flow through the bridge opening generates an upstream movement of water along the abutment face. The mixing action of the two flows causes scour. By placement of a spur dike at the bridge abutment, the total approach flow is blended upstream, away from the bridge abutment. And the end spans of the bridge opening become more effective in carrying the water in a downstream direction. To determine the most appropriate design for spur dikes, a research project sponsored by the highway departments of Alabama and Mississippi, in cooperation with the Bureau of Public Roads, was conducted at Colorado State University in 1958. The results of this study are published in Highway Research Board Bulletin 286, titled Drainage Structures, Design and Performance, 1960. In the laboratory flume, colored dyes were injected into the flow upstream of the roadway embankment. The flow moves towards the bridge opening. As the two flows converge, mixing action can be observed in the vicinity of the bridge abutment. Time-lapse photography shows clearly the movement of sand on the sides and bottom of the scour hole created by the mixing action. The contour lines show the scour hole and are indicative of potential problems that could cause damage or failure of the bridge and approach embankment. By adding a straight spur dike upstream of the bridge abutment, the mixing action is shifted from the bridge abutment to near the end of the spur dike. Note the flow separation at the end of the dike and the complete absence of mixing action adjacent to the bridge abutment. By the use of time-lapse photography, the development of scour is seen along the dike face. The 
contoured scour hole shows the extent of damage in the sand bed. The end of a straight spur dike is highly vulnerable to scour damage. Therefore, this shape is not recommended. By adding a spur dike shaped as a portion of an ellipse, a favorable flow pattern is produced. Flow separation at the dike end is at a minimum, and thus more efficient use of the entire bridge opening is accomplished. This is a two and one half to one elliptical shape. Three to one, two to one, and one and one half to one elliptical shapes were also tested. Time-lapse photography shows the movement of sand along the two and one half to one elliptically shaped spur dike. This configuration produced the most favorable flow conditions of those shapes tested. Although scour depths resulting from use of the two and one half to one spur dike were less than would occur if no dike were used, the real advantages are in shifting the scour location away from the abutment and directing the flow more uniformly through the complete bridge opening. The following conclusions were made from the laboratory studies. One, spur dikes are effective in reducing the depth of scour in the vicinity of bridge abutments and adjacent piers. Two, proper location for the spur dike is at the abutment. Side slope of the dike should be a continuation of the slope of the spill-through type abutment. Three, the most favorable shape of those investigated is a quarter of an ellipse with a major to minor axis ratio of two and one half to one. This bridge crossing the Susquehanna River at Nanticoke, Pennsylvania had experienced scour problems at the end piers since its construction in 1956. Attempts to protect the scoured areas with riprap proved relatively unsuccessful and a spur dike was constructed upstream of the bridge abutment. These scenes were taken during the flood of March 1964. Contrasting colors show the flow pattern around the dike end. Alignment of the piers and spur dike parallel the flood flow. The length of embankment on the flood plain is about 500 feet. The tree line is the approximate line between the main channel and the overbank area. From the bridge, a closer view of the dike end and the flow pattern is seen. The dike was constructed before results of the laboratory studies were available, and a straight dike ending with a circular arc was used. As a consequence, well-defined flow separation is noted as an arc starting at the upstream end of the dike and extending to a point about 100 feet from the dike face. Flow velocity is high at the end of the dike, and some scour can be expected to take place in this area. Flow adjacent to the dike face is nearly motionless, and therefore not effective in carrying the water in a downstream direction. A few weeks later, the flood waters had receded, and a study of the scour damage was made. This view is from the bridge looking upstream. The major scour area exists at the end of the dike where flow velocities were highest. Isolated minor scour pockets are noted along the dike face. Scour was much less than had occurred before construction of the dike, even though the 1964 flood exceeded earlier scour-producing floods.
The dike is 400 feet long, about 30 feet high, 10 feet wide at the top, and has one and one-half to one side slopes. The dike was constructed entirely of rock since this material was readily available. The major scour consisted mainly of stripping the grass sod. The maximum depth of scour is about two feet and is far removed from the abutment. This dike did a good job in preventing scour damage in the vicinity of the bridge abutment during this unusual flood. Through observation of the laboratory studies previously shown and actual field installations, spur dikes are recommended as an effective means for reducing scour in the vicinity of bridge abutments and for increasing the flow efficiency of bridge waterway areas. This plan view shows spur dike dimensions that give the most effective design. The shape is one-fourth of a two and one-half to one ellipse. A minimum length of 150 feet is recommended. Riprap should be placed for half of the length on the main channel side and to the end of the short radius curve on the back side. A cross-section shows the top width is governed by the type of construction equipment used. Riprap should be placed above design flood elevation, and the side slope should be approximately 2 to 1 or flatter. Material for the construction of spur dikes may be the same as that used for the roadway embankment. Spur dikes are needed at locations where a considerable amount of flow is diverted from the floodplain to the bridge opening. Field experience has proved that the construction of spur dikes will eliminate many scour problems associated with bridge crossings, and their use will permit a shorter bridge in many locations. The use of these structures will result in a worthwhile savings to the highway programs of the country.